over the several months uh, that it was unfolding. Um, and I eventually was able to get out there. Um, it took, took a lot of saving, um, uh, waiting tables, but uh, I was able to get uh, some time at the protests. Um, that's where I met uh, our producer, uh, you probably saw the credits, Jen Martell, who um, is a shy Sioux and works on Standing Rock uh, as a media liaison. Um, and she was there, um, and she essentially said, listen, uh, all eyes on us, the whole world's watching us right now, this is amazing, this is a wonderful time for us, but we have so many more stories to tell, um, there's so much vibrancy in our community, um, and there are other issues, and they're, they're tied together. Um, when the cameras leave uh, Standing Rock one day, we don't want it to feel like a, a one-issue moment in our history. Um, so come back and, you know, we'll, we'll give you the access, we'll tell our story, I'll help you out. Um, and she was pretty essential for that. Um, it took a couple of years to put it together after that. Um, and uh, uh, I was able to find a little bit of funding, scrape it together, I called Ben, and uh, the, the rest is history. Ben, talk about the idea that this became so much more than what you originally went out there for. Mm -hmm. um, laws were changed, quiet laws were changed, partly because of what happened. Things did go in a different route than what you expected, certainly. A lot of the people we saw in the film went to jail, not just in the film, but additionally. It really changed the focus of where you guys wanted to take. Yeah, I think the most important thing to talk about in terms of where, where the focus of the film was, was that it, it wasn't dictated by a brand new. Um, we were really creating the film in conversation with our subjects. And that's not something you typically find in a documentary. Typically they say, you know, don't show the film to your subjects until it's like done and <laughs> see how they feel. But obviously, um, you know, that it was very important for us to make the film to tell the stories that the people that you see on the screen wanted to tell, uh, particularly because Brandon and I are not indigenous. Uh, and that's also where Jen, our producer, who we're so sad couldn't be here today, um, but she's, she's usually around with us at the end uh, But she was just as instrumental in putting the story together, and not only was one of our main producers, uh, but also our story supervisor. So that said, yes, the story shifted and changed, and that's the hardest thing about, I think, making a doc about current events, is that they are current. <laughs> and so we would, you know, we had a cut of the film when there were decisions that hadn't even been made yet about the pipeline. And, you know, we also cover a lot of different topics in the film that all tie their way back in the pipeline, and it was just all moving parts and pieces. Eventually, of course, you have to finish a movie. Um, but we do feel like we tried to kind of freeze it as a moment in time within all of it, and we left their room, <laughs> room for captions at the end. By the time this thing gets released uh, through distribution, we can just say, and this is where everything's at. <laughs> Brandon, talk to me about finding and striking up a friendship with Chase Paradise. He really became the storyteller. And you, you could not have done this without his input. Uh, yeah, Chase, uh, Chase is elusive. Um, Chase is hard to find. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it was thanks to Jen um, and uh, the Lakota People's Law Project as well. We had, uh, the night before we met Chase, had just struck up a, a friendship with the director of uh, that organization, too. Um, was instrumental in, in helping us regard a lot of uh, the archival footage which you see that come back to the pipeline. Um, and Chase, uh, we met him at the treaty conference. Uh, we had gone to try and meet Phyllis, uh, which we did, obviously. Um, and, and Jen and Danny were like, go find Chase. And, um, and Danny, who uh, uh, runs the Lakota People's Law Project, was like, okay, you're probably doing about five minutes between him leaving the stage and him getting to his car. Um, so you should you should go find him. And uh, I was able to, and he was like very hesitant to speak with us at all, uh, very hesitant to film with us, uh, which is funny because the opening scene with him in the movie is one of our favorites. Uh, he, he just went he just went and we followed and, and it was awesome. Uh, and but uh, the the thing that we love to joke about is that uh, he you know we're both white, um, uh, and he was like, this isn't going to be some white people thing where it's about the poor Indian and there's like some solitary flute in the back. <laughs> I was like, no, we're really trying to, you know, 
let you tell the story. And he's like, okay, cool, you can roll with me for a little bit. And uh, that ended up blossoming. We rolled with him for three years. <laughs> <laughs> this is part of the solitary flute conversation. We moved that microphone down and talk music because so much of the music, and I'll let Brent explain after you're done about the orchestration and the score, but your music really helps tell the story. Yeah. Well, a lot of the story that you guys can see on the screen is really just the tip of the iceberg of what's really happening in the uh, native country. When the, the, a couple of the captions that showed up saw um, you know, the, the sexual assault on Native women is a, almost every woman in my family experienced it. My mom, my aunties, her mom, their mom, like it's very, very deep. So with that uh, in my blood, you know, all those different traumatic events that get passed down. Um, when I was younger, I, just, I felt sad a lot and I didn't know why. And then I started learning about inter intergenerational trauma. Um, I started realizing that a lot of that sadness had been passed down. And so when it came time to like start feeling those things and understanding in my teenage years, that's when it became so easy to write. Once I found out how to write a poem, once I found out how to write a rhyme, it started turning into how can I start telling a lot of these situations that are happening through music. Because a lot of my favorite artists do that. They, they tell what's going on in communities, they talk about the real issues. Um, and the reality is, is that nobody's gonna tell our story for us. So, you know, even with this documentary, it's another platform allowing natives to tell their story, but they're allowing us to tell it rather than them taking the information and then sitting there in front of the camera and narrating all of it. And I've always I've just applauded these guys for that heavily because that's how it's been in the past, where you get a group of Native Americans who are telling their story and then they think, oh, cool, cool. <laughs> Bye. And then they get in front of the camera and then they tell it for us. Um, but through the music, I mean, music is universal. And one thing that, um, I always felt a little iffy about was doing hip hop through, be, you know, being a Native American, being um, in, the, in the traditional way. You know, me and my brother would sing prayer songs, we sing at powwows and stuff. So, you know, there's a lot. I've, I've heard criticism from, you know, fellow natives that say that that's not traditional. But in reality, oral tradition is traditional. We tell stories through words. So being able to do that through music, um, and like I said, if it's film, if I can make it to a high level, then you know, if I, like when, when Kendrick Lamar talks, the whole world listens. So anything that he says, you know, that, that's, that's, that, that's always been the goal for me through music is to be able to take this story of these things that happened over a span of 100, 200 years, but modernize it for the youth. Because they're the, really the ones who are going to soak up that information the same way I did when I was younger. When I listened to Nas, I wanted to write like Nas. I wanted to tell stories like him. So hopefully now there's, when I do this and they see this, now a younger generation might want to do that and it might inspire more and ripple out and eventually spark something new um, for future generations to become leaders as well. Well, before you get to Brandon and the other part of the music, if anybody wants to line up, go ahead, there's a microphone here, you can get started. But I just wanted to ask you, Stuart, the idea of the Cleveland International Film Festival now dedicates a section to indigenous films. What does that mean to you that that kind of attention is being paid? And we're not in the Dakotas right now. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, um, you know, like there's, there's a, I always joke around about having an inner Kanye, um, the ego. I believe our people deserve that, that right. Uh, I believe our people have tremendous amounts of potential that does rarely see the light of day because of all the traumatic issues over the years. Um, so, that right there is, it's, it's amazing for not just like people like me, but like people out there, other indigenous people. It gives them hope, it gives them something to strive for. Because it's like if, you know, if, if I wanted to make a film and I'm sitting there like, how do I even get into these? And, like there's no slot for us. But now with that, now it might give them some motivation to want to make a film, to reach and, you know, submit into that slot to just to be, you know, giving a space for us basically. You know, we, we don't really, we don't really have a seat at a lot of tables, you know, but that gives us, that sets a table for us, you know what I mean? So this is your first of many credits. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon, talk to me about the other music that went into the film. The, the indigenous use, the, the score, um, illustration. Yeah, so a, a lot of the music is composed by Jared Tiki Cha Cha Hati, who is a Chickasaw um, from Oklahoma. Um, and uh, uh, he's, just one of the great composers of our time. 
um, not just an indigenous composer, but composer in general. He's starting to really get that record recognition. Um, he studied here in Cleveland at um, CIA, um, which is awesome. And uh, he's been recognized for that. But um, Ben and I, from the beginning, we were like, how do we infuse this story with as much uh, indigenous voice as possible? And that also comes down to the music. Um, and so there's over 40 minutes of indigenous music between Jared's composition, Stuart, and a tribe called Red, who played at the, at the end. Um, and I don't know if we talk about getting to uh, do the, do the um, orchestration. Oh, yeah, that was really cool. So yeah, we got to, uh, uh, first of all, Jared, uh, Jared Tate was a, was a real pleasure to work with. And he was just on board and got home from the beginning, and that was, Awesome and a shock to us because he's very busy and, and a very important guy uh, as an indigenous classical composer. Uh, but we did get to go to Oklahoma and record the whole score there, like on, on indigenous land. Um, super cool, great group of people, and just and we're, we'll put a little feature act together actually because we shot that too. Uh, and Jared Tate is just really a master of what he does. And uh, also we have our additional uh, our additional scorer is also in the crowd somewhere. So thanks to him too. There he is, back there. <laughs> he had about 15 minutes of music and it was rockets. <laughs> um, we wanted to talk about the youth at the reservation. Finding Takata was just, it was a gem. We went back in 2020 during the pandemic. Everybody loves that scene where she just eyeballs the camera and then talks down her dad and his like, language. Oh, just a great scene. But what did it mean to be able to see the torch being passed from generation A to B, or in this case, F to G? Um, it, the, the generational torch passing was really a big point of focus for the synthesis of the film. So we cover, in our, sort of in our main characters, we cover four generations essentially. We have Phyllis, Chase, uh, Stuart, and Takata. And the reason that we did this, and this is more to Brandon's point about wanting to keep uh, telling the story in as, in as indigenous a way as possible, is that in through many different tribes, it's not universal, but it's certainly for the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, there's this idea of the seventh generation that governance is about thinking seven generations ahead. Uh, if we all did that, I think we'd live in a very different world. Uh, but one thing we really did want to emphasize in the film is that there is a passing down, right? Not just of stories and traditional and ancient knowledge, but of of the responsibility, right? Because there's a there's a responsibility not only as stewards to the to our world that we all live in, but in terms of preserving and protecting land and culture. Um, so yeah, generational the, the the whole generational aspect of the film. Uh, I'm glad that you noticed it. <laughs> I also wanted to ask you about the journalism per se, because this was not normal okay, journalism. Can I just have one thing? Please. Um, so I, I also just want to apologize real quick. Uh, there were some sound issues. Um, I'm sure you noticed that people were talking and you couldn't hear what they were saying. Not that we were um, in charge. But <laughs> um, there was one line that I think sums up that whole thing uh, from Andrea Carmen, who was the UN uh, representative. Um, and it's like one of the most important lines in the film. <laughs> and she says, um, no matter what happens here in the UN, no matter what happens with the United States, whatever we do in this room, uh, the most important thing that we can do is pass our knowledge on to the next generation, is pass that on to our kids and make sure that they're set up um, and they have their traditional tribal knowledge. And um, I think that sums it up, that, uh, of thinking ahead and um, wanting to infuse that in the film with uh, Takata as well. Uh, obviously, the end of the film uh, almost centers around her and Stuart um, taking on the challenges that Chase and Phyllis were dealing with. How did you wind up shooting in the UN? <laughs> uh, we were very lucky. Um, they didn't want us to come in. Uh, we got the call at 7.30 p.m. the night before um, saying, you better be there at 8 a.m. Uh, and we were like, oh, great, okay. Um, and so it was just uh, Ben and I um, and uh, Jacopo. Jacopo. We, were, we were in the scratch together as sound person. Um, and uh, it was actually it was quite difficult. The UN doesn't usually let a film crew 
groups um, for really international security reasons, or at least that's what they say. Um, but they didn't want us to have uh, the sound person in the room, which is why uh, Andrea's interview is outside. They didn't want um, us filming outside of the conference room. That was the only place we had, uh, and we had to really schmooze some security guards to get that footage of her walking around the assembly room. Um, and we kept having a guy come up to us uh, outside with like, oh, a, like an AK-47 being like, you, you guys get that camera off. We're like, oh, okay, thank you, and we put it down. And then five minutes later, Oh, the interview was was all covert. I held the camera like this is the I, I was drinking like a little coffee, like oh, we're just holding the camera, we're having a conversation. It's not. I mean, we're not really. We hit the sound guy behind a bush. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking of uh, covert and shooting in places where you don't normally, I don't know if you can tell, but the interview with one of the interviews with Representative Holland was in Smithsonian, in the Indigenous Peoples Exhibit. Well, I mean, you've got more to talk about because you kind of directed her through that. You just been... Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, well, we got fortunate in that way, too, uh, just because our executive producer, Sandra Evers Manley, she had some connections to, to get us in there. Also, the, the, first big, the first big hurdle was getting to interview Jeff Holland. <laughs> and once we were able to get into that office, then all of a sudden the Smithsonian's like, oh, yeah, you can put Jeff Holland here and interview her. That's dope. Um, so that was great, and it was it was really awesome having her in there. Uh, the fact that we, I mean, we got to shoot with Deb Holland three times, and she was just, I mean, she is she is a national treasure. She is an incredible woman, and incredibly inspiring. And to have to walk her through that space, uh, it was there's a bittersweetness to it, right? Because it's it's all sitting there in a museum, uh, and you know th that museum in particular is it's. Honor, it's honoring and respecting indigenous tribes and cultures, but it, there is this, uh, the, the lasting reverberations of colonization certainly are not um, unknown uh, from that situation, but it was, it, was, it was amazing having her there. And one of the interesting things uh, that uh, is lucky for the, uh, or interesting for the, for the, for the background is um, it's a very quick shot, but um, Deb Holland is looking over something, um, and there's like light coming up from it. And what is in that case is the Treaty of Fort Leonard, um, the one that we discussed uh, between the Lakota, Dakota, and Dakota. Um, it's on display. It's something that was actually, until the last couple of decades, considered a myth by the U.S. government. They just claimed that treaties hadn't happened, um, and so like the fact that the document was on display in the Smithsonian, and you have Deb Holland, the first indigenous uh, woman to be a congresswoman, and the first indigenous person in a cabinet of, uh, of a president to look over that right after the interview was a pretty powerful moment for us. Did the film change at this filmmakers? Did you suddenly need to highlight her more when she became Secretary of the Interior? Was there as much depth as we saw now, previous to that? I don't think so. I think we were already pretty stoked to have her just as a congresswoman. <laughs> and then when that happened, we were just celebrating, not just for the sake of the film, but for the sake of the country and the future of it. <laughs> Stuart, I promise I'll let you talk about the box agenda. Things that you're doing for kids out there truly matter. That's something that we can take an example and use across the United States. But you talk about the, the suicide rates and the abuse on the reservation. You're trying to fight that through fighting, actually. Yeah. Well, see, the, the thing about um, the energy that, that kids get, um, they have a lot of energy here the day, and the hardest part is how do you channel that energy into something productive. And a lot of the kids there, um, they get caught up in doing things, because there's not a lot to do on the reservation. You're either playing ball, partying, or you're at home. So that's, you know, three things to do in a big area. And a lot of the times, a lot of the kids are subjected to partying and all that because they don't have anything else to do and they don't really have a group of people to really connect with that are trying to do anything because there's a lot of ambitious people on the reservation but the problem is like I said they get caught up in that because a lot of you know when you go to the rec centers it's only the good people playing ball so it's like you have to be good at ball to even play so it's, it's just a hard thing but um, the, the one thing was that you know boxing is just it's universal I use that term a lot because there's a lot of things that, that that can take you from anywhere in the world. If you're good at boxing, you can go overseas and fight in the Olympics. You 
can do all of that. So it's like, um, you know, it, it creates opportunity, but the, the thing is, is that um, leading by example, you know, you gotta, you gotta give your time to these youth, you gotta, t you gotta love them, you gotta care about them in order for them to feel that, you gotta genuinely have that. And a lot of the issue is, uh, my, my dad told me this, was that it's consistency. There's not been enough consistency where, when I was about 14, there was a boxing club that was up for like a month, and then they just stopped it. Because I think the guy, didn't, he didn't get funding or something happened, but we did ours um, all out of our own pocket. Um, we reconstructed our garage into a gym, and uh, we just gave everything that we had to that. And we did have a pretty big team, and then it dwindled down. We still got one boy who fights consistently, and he's 4 all right now, and um, he's very, very talented. He might be, you know, to me, I just think he's the, he's the next, like, big name for natives. And, uh, but the reason why we did that, like I said, is because um, there's just nothing for them to do out there. And at that time, when we had the team going, there were so many people coming through there, people who I never really knew would just show up just to want to work out to see what it was all about. Um, we had some people come in and try to test the boys, and then they leave, kind of beat up. <laughs> but it was like, it was cool because when our boys would do that, they'd sit them down and say, like, a lot of the philosophy that I had about, you know, there's a difference between boxing and fighting with love. Like, and it's like, just because you can fight doesn't mean you have to, like, go and be that person. You don't have to beat people up. So, you know, the, one of the issues is that just, you know, like, just because you can doesn't always mean you should, you know. So there's a lot of, like, we, we would take our practices and, and they would turn into like full-blown talking circles at one point. You know, like we, we would get done with our workout and we'd all sit around and talk for about an hour, hour and a half. Because it was all during the pandemic, so a lot of the kids didn't have nothing to do, so they would just we'd all just sit in there and, and, it, and it gave those kids a safe place to talk because they don't get, they may even say that, like I don't get to talk about these types of things with other people. So it was like, you know, being able to give that space for them is just, but it, you know, it, it, it's a blessing, but I realized it's because my mom and dad gave us that type of space our whole life. So, you know, like it all ties in with, the, you know, passing down to the next generation. You know, my mom and dad gave us that, now we get to give that to them, and now they're going to pass that on. So it's just like a never ending circle of, you know, knowledge and different uh, practices and healing. So I like how you work the circle back in yeah. <laughs> Let's go to the audience. Uh, I'm going to give Brandon a lot of comments in private. Mm -hmm. I have a relationship with them. But Emil, uh, your comment on governing for seventh generation, uh, it's very enlightening. I'm going to have to figure out how to apply that to my life. Um, Stuart, here's my question for you. The, the choice of genre of music that you selected, or rap music, uh, was it influenced by rap as a protest medium? A, and how do you avoid in that the machismo that sometimes is in rap music, especially given what you said, the prevalence of sexual violence, mm -hmm. violence against women that is, uh, you know, kind of a challenge within that community right now? So the, the you know, for, for myself, I knew stepping into being a, a native rapper, you know, I already, I already knew what was coming with that. But to me, I look at hip hop and what I've learned about it, I've watched, you know, I've, I've tried to study as much as I do as I could about hip hop before I even started rapping because I just loved it. Um, so I understood that it's, 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 hip hop is its own culture. Native American is its own culture. So if I want people to respect our culture and not appropriate it, I have to respect this culture and not appropriate it. Mm -hmm. So I respect the hip hop period from the get-go, and one of the things that I try to do with my music is I never try to be untruthful to who I am. So authenticity is a big thing, and, and that's just who I've always been, even before consciously thinking about that, stepping into it. Um, because I was always that kid when, when I would be around my friends, or my cousins, or whatever, and one of them starts lying, and I just sit there and I'm like, I can't be quiet, and I just look at them like, you didn't do that. <laughs> or like, you know, like, you're poor, like, this guy's lying, you know, and I would see that, and, I, and for some reason that just always bothered me. So, like, especially through music, that was I never wanted to be somebody that I'm not, um, and that's kind of I've never been approached outside of the native community as me being a rapper is like a bad thing. But it's been it's been my own people that have criticized me the most. When I go to, you know, I always wanted to be a hip hop 
hip-hop artist that's native, not a native hip-hop artist. Mm -hmm. So it's like learning how to separate yourself, stepping into this lane with the utmost respect for that culture, and then bringing my message with that. So it's like I try to make music that, you know, like, that J. Cole would make or Kendrick would make because that's, how, that's the type of music that I love doing. So that's kind of how I've navigated through it without, um, you know, saying things that is, you know, taboo for rappers, you know, I try not to disrespect women, I try not to, I try not to cuss a lot. <laughs> but it's like, I, I just, I wanna, I want, I want something that my rapper could listen to and be like, that's pretty good. And I've gotten that response from a lot of elderly people, a lot of older people that 50, 60 on up that can say, like, I like what you said. And it's yeah. the <laughs> style. <laughs> so, it's, so it's, it's kind of cool that my dad, especially my dad, hates rap, but he will, but when he listens to my stuff, he's, you know, he applauds it. So it's like, I've, I've just tried to be a good writer before anything, try to be a respect the craft of it before anything. And I think that's why I've never really had an issue with it as far as, like, um, you know, people outside of the Native community. So, yeah. Thank you. So I have a production question, and then I also have a question for Stuart. But um, so the overlays of the archival footage um, with the <laughs> with the current footage, I I feel like we we've, we've seen both before, and I think that the way that they were overlaid with each other created this really visceral experience, and it's one that I think I also saw in like. Um, the trial of the Chicago 7, and so, and I actually streamed your film before I saw the trial of the Chicago 7, and I was thinking about, um, I was wondering specifically for you guys if you took the archival footage and then tried to search through um, the current footage and interlay them, or if they just, there were happy accidents that happened and you noticed them, but like, what was that process like? Like, of overlaying those things and choosing what footage was more important, or not what was more important. What you I mean, I would say it's a little, a little bit of both. Um, and the, I mean, the first thing we did was get as much archival as possible mm -hmm. uh, because we wanted the story to be the circle, the choker that we talked about at the beginning. That the, the systemic oppression is a cycle, mm -hmm. but so is the protest and fight. Mm -hmm. So. Um, we hope that that's what you get from the movie. Um, and so the, the sections being that way um, uh, is supposed to show that cycle. Um, though uh, it was Ben who, um, as the editor, who put together, I, I think, probably the most visceral moment of that, where at the end we were a little more playful with the, uh, uh, the march. Of the yeah, that, that was like, that was a year ago. And this is a good question for the both of us because this is it's a, it's a real all you. Because Brandon's the archival producer and I'm the editor. So and all cool things archival that you saw was very much like him setting it up and then me kind of. And then there were moments in the edit where Ben was like, okay, I've been on this for five hours. Where can I find a drum that looks like the drum that he found? Yeah, yeah. And, and that, I mean, some of, the other, some of those were just sort of like we would be watching. I mean, the, I don't want to dig too, too deep, but like the, the process of getting all the archival was super interesting. Like, one thing I would love to mention, just because when you watch films like this and you think, oh, like they really Googled some cool images there, and how did, no, we were in the, we were in the National Archives, Library of Congress, we were there with our, like, in the National Archives with our, like, little badges and our little magnifying glasses and having them in their, like, very special, you know, Xerox machine where they, like, digitize it. And, um, but anyways, the, that, that is all to say, to your point, uh, Half of it was, hey, where, where can we maybe find a shot that, that reflects this? And the other half was like, as we're looking through our kind of footage, like, oh, oh, shoot, like we have something kind of like that. Like, and we're sitting on about 800 hours of archive footage. So there was like, <laughs> to find, I mean, it's, there's, there's definitely ways to find things when you have that much. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. it takes months, months at a time, I think it took six months just to get like a, a true rough cut of the dapple scenes, mm -hmm. um, which also, those scenes were cut in half. Or in, the, in our first draft, we had 32 minutes of the Dakota Access Pipeline struggle, wow. um, and now there's about 15 minutes. And that's all, that decision is thanks to Jen, who can't be with us here today, but she was 
it's like we're getting the community is getting real tired of all the devil stuff. <laughs> like they're like, got it, heard, here we go. <laughs> And then I have a question for Stuart. It's clear who your inspirations are and that you've developed your own cadence and your own uh, like narrative and lyrical style. But I'm wondering, because you said you, you've had sort of like the pit taken out of you a lot. Um, I'm wondering if the presence of a hip hop artist has inspired kiddos in your community. Have you seen that yet? And then I'm also just um, Wondering if you have a community of other indigenous artists and specifically you have hip-hop artists who you can communicate with. Yeah, um, so being like at home, uh, I think the, the music was what really actually brought people to the boxing gym. Uh, because I don't know how people view me, so uh, I spoke at the Four Winds School and the Four Winds, just everybody knows just one state championship back home. Ooh. And they were undefeated. That's the first time in history that a team has ever got undefeated that far. But anyway, so I spoke at Four Winds a few years ago, and, and a lot of the kids there um, were just, they were interested in, in like the boxing, and it was a lot of them. When we started training together, they started saying, like, oh, I hear your music all the time, like, I never really met you. And um, they were just kind of like, you know, and they would look up to me like a big brother almost. And, and then as far as the second part of your question, that's how I look at a lot of other hip hop artists that I know. Um, we're actually going to Detroit tomorrow to open up for Snotty Little Reds Kids. They're from Canada. Um, we're opening for them on Saturday. Me and my buddy Selfie, he goes by, he's from Detroit. And um, there is a pretty big, um, like a big crowd of indigenous hip hop artists. And um, so, but me and Selfie, we're kind of the people who um, we really, really try to keep it true to everything that I'm trying to be about. We don't want to step in and try to, um, you know, do a, try to put flutes over everything, and try to, like, put native drums over everything. We, just, we, we like rapping, yeah. but we also like telling the story. So that, those are the people that inspire me. And one of my other buddies is uh, Jimmy C. He's, to me, he's the greatest rapper that I know, like, ever. But he's somebody who just does not care about being in front of the camera. He doesn't care about who listens to his stuff, but he's, to me, he's the greatest writer that I know. And I can call him. I, I make this joke that if my life depended on it, he would answer my call every time I call him because he's the only person that I like, like, pick up every time. But he's, but I'll sit and talk to him for sometimes two hours about, and it's not even music related, mm -hmm. but all of his philosophies and a lot of the things that he talks about inspire the music a lot. So like a lot of, that's, that's the kind of community that I like is, you know, we're, we're all a bunch of, <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. As we begin to close here, I really want to ask both producers to answer this, and, and Bill, you can go first. How has this experience changed you, certainly as non-Indigenous men, going and spending so much time on rest? It's, uh, I know I speak for both of us when I say that it's changed us in extreme. Uh, I think my own experience well, a few, a few things. One is, is just making amazing friends, especially people like Stuart. Like Stuart and I are just chat. <laughs> and we want to work on some other stuff together in the future. But I think in terms of just my worldview, I mean, these are, our, these are issues that I cared about coming into the film. And th there's a difference between sort of kind of being an activist at a distance, which is not really, that's not activism. It's sort of paying attention, there's a difference between paying attention, and there's a difference between that and being on the ground and understanding systemic oppression not as this just vague concept, but seeing, oh, that is um, but seeing and, and witnessing firsthand and being with people who are experiencing the reverberations of that every day. So it's not, it, it, it's so hard, and even with watching a movie too, it's like you can look at all these concepts, but the reason that we wanted to jump into the lives of the people that you see on screen is because it's just, it's all, we're all just people uh, trying to get by. And so I'd say that's the biggest difference, is, is taking the ideas of like systemic oppression and imposed poverty and all the things that we can kind of intellectualize about and sort of seeing, feeling, and understanding and, ex and being there to witness what, it, what that actually means in individuals' lives. Um, and a lot of it was really hard, and a lot of it was really inspiring. And I hope that we made both of those feelings come through in the film. 
Brandon, you know, I know a lot of the backstory. He was at home with us for about six months during this five-year process in Manhattan the rest of the time. I saw the struggle. So what did this do to you? How did it make you a person who's different than when it started in 17? I mean, I, I, uh, as Ben said, it's like down to the molecular core of my being. It's, it's, it's different. Um, and it's, it comes from getting to listen to our subjects and getting to be, I mean, truly in like, in, in, in greatness. It's like, Phyllis Young spent time with Russell Means uh, and was at the UN the first time in international community ever recognized indigenous people as a people. I mean, for hundreds of years, we pretend to, I mean, to this day, in different shades, we pretend that indigenous people don't exist. Um, Phyllis changed that. Russell changed that. Russell got shot on Standing Rock, and he called Phyllis and was like, you, you better go to work. It's like, you know, he wasn't like, oh my gosh, I, I'm hurt. You know, he, he was like, let's, let's keep going, let's go, let's go, let's go. Um, to be able to sit and have coffee with her and listen to her stories, um, to sit with Chase, um, whose entire life changed around when he decided he wanted to help his people, to spend time with Stuart, who's leading the charge of our generation, um, and really just being. And um, something I love is, is one of my favorite lines is when Phyllis says, I'm the evidence of the Western Hemisphere. Um, and it, it's moments like that, um, it's getting to spend time in the UN, with uh, Andrea, who um, the the International Indian Treaty Council is small, uh, but they they were instrumental in the Paris Agreements. Like in world history, that could be a defining moment in human history. And that push came from Andrea Carmen to say you need to listen to Indigenous voices. And we're not talking about that now, um, but the fact that they were there, the fact that they helped bring it about, like. Indigenous people have always been here, they always will be here, and their stories, and I mean, even saying this next to Stuart, I feel like Stuart should get to say these things, but it's, like, it's time for us to listen and to step back, and um, that's something that I'll be carrying with me the rest of my life. I'll always want to go to the Reds, I'll always, you know, Stuart calls me and says, come hang out, you know, I'm not the Grammys. You know, I'll be like, absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah. Story James, Bill Benjamin, Brandon Jackson, we got to thank you.
Thank you.